We can and call I'm, it remarkable and, radiology. <laughs> remarkable radiology, absolutely. All right, you can see my screen, I assume? Yes. And excellent, excellent. And just want to give a plug for um, Jordan Perchick. He is um, one of the radiology re residents at UAB who I went to high school with, who thankfully put together all these cases and incredible pictures. Um, and Dr. Bajaj is going to talk us through them. So um, this is our first time doing this. So feedback, please let us know um, if you like this format. And Dr. Bajaj, let us know, you know after this. Hopefully we can have you on for more if this works for you or if there's other ways you can think about yeah. it. Maybe we can do it a little bit better. Well, we'll we'll work on it together, and I, I mean I think it looks great so far. So, um, all right. So we have mystery cases. So, mm -hmm. looks like a thirty-three-year-old strict dieting and exercise with thirty pounds of weight loss in the past three months. Um, Notice early satiety and abdominal distension. Now to the ER with three hours of nausea and abdominal distension after dinner with one episode of vomiting. Okay. So taking a look at the lower chest, there's something going on here in the um, distal esophagus, something, I mean, retrocardiac area. Uh, if this is the esophagus, and I'd have to kind of scroll to make sure, this is way too thick. So okay, can you... You know, you, you do this faster than I can understand it, Sanjeev. So I bet it's faster than other people can understand it. So the 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 sort of uh, grayer place, and it looks like there's a starfish in the middle of it. Right. Okay. So this is the heart right here. These are lungs, and because we're on soft tissue windows, we the lungs just look like air. They look like the air out here. These are bones. This is the aorta. These are just some small branch vessels. And then this right here is something. I'd have to scroll up and down to see what that something is. It could be the esophagus or it could be like adjacent compressing mass, like a lymph node or something. I think it's probably the esophagus because this thing that looks like a tooth or a starfish in the middle of it could be the esophageal lumen. But it also could be a somewhat necrotic lymph node with you know, some preserved stuff in the middle. So um, difficult to say exactly what's what here, but this is clearly not normal. Um, so that's something. And then this stomach is gigantic. So if we take a look, this is the liver. This is the spleen. And this is a stomach. And that stomach is huge. Um, here you have kidneys, pancreas, liver, spleen. We're coming down. There's some sort of an abnormal density here. That may just be a, a portion of a, a, a wall of a bowel loop because we have these markedly distended loops of small bowel hair. And okay, that, a couple of things, Sanji. So we like to make sure that everybody understands everything that's going on. And, and uh, I do a lot of talking, but I'm, I'm really want everyone in the audience, if there's something the, that confuses you, either put it in the text and I'll say it, or you can stop and ask Sanjeev. Uh, for, Sanjeev, why don't you introduce yourself um, so that everybody understands who you are and why we were so excited to have you on here. Yeah, so I'm... Uh a garden variety radiologist. Uh, I'm a, a body specialist. I work at the VA. Um, body CT and ultrasound are my two, uh, body MRI and ultrasound are my two fellowships. I do mostly body CT and ultrasound nowadays. Um, and uh, body sort of being chest, abdomen, pelvis. Um, and uh, I, was, I was born and raised in Birmingham, traveled around a bit for my education, went to med school here, went to uh, radiology residency and fellowship at WashU, and then came back here. And uh, now I'm at the VA and uh, I love it. It's great. I get to work with people who taught me like uh, Dr. Centaur, who 15 years ago uh, had I had on, uh, on service. So it's great. Okay, so th th this one right here, 
uh, those, lar those, those large um, oblong things are uh, small, look like small bowel to me. Could you explain why that looks like small bowel? Yeah, so if you look at them, you see these, the, the way you can sort of definitively identify small bowel and differentiate from other um, loops of, of bowel is that you have these, the valvuli canivientes, if you see right here, these are the valvuli. And small bowel has symmetric, uh, symmetric valvuli and they're complete, they're complete rings, whereas your colon would be incomplete rings and they're not quite as symmetric. So here we see some symmetric valvuli. Um, and that indicates that these are small bowel loops. Uh, also, the colon at this point is retroperitoneal. So, and these are, these look like they're pretty intraperitoneal. So that's probably a little piece of colon right there. And that might be some colon there, although it looks like that's an intraperitoneal. That may be transverse colon, but um, the colon's probably somewhere in here. So these are small bowel and they're not supposed to be this big, obviously. These are massively dilated and fluid filled with some air fluid levels. If you took a look at this on radiographs uh, and the patient were upright, you'd probably see that stair stepping that you classically see. And you have a bunch of decompressed small bowel over here, which makes me think this is a high grade small bowel obstruction. And I'm starting to wonder, I haven't looked at this case and I don't know much about it, if this is some sort of a a, a closed loop, or B, the other thing I, I think about when I think of a patient with strict dieting, rapid weight loss, developing nausea, is something like a nutcracker syndrome uh, or an SMA syndrome. And it, this has that look to it where you have a markedly distended stomach. You come here, and I wonder if on the next slice they're going to show, well, not really. I'm wondering if there could be compression by the SMA hair, um, especially given the history. That's not super unlikely. Here we see this loop that's not dilated. I guess maybe not because they, they normally would show me that. It looks like it's a woman um, with a, a good, good looking IUD. Hey, she's got some pretty big time inguinal lymphadenopathy hair. So if you look at her inguinal regions, that's interesting. If you look at our inguinal regions, those are lymph nodes. Well, no, you know what? Maybe she just has really big leg muscles. Wow. Yeah, I guess she has very well-developed leg musculature. Okay. So we have a stomach. It comes up. That all looks like stomach. And then it looks like it is coming up to into a small bowel loop here. Yeah, there we go. That SMA is awfully close to the aorta. What I would need to see, it looks like, I think Jordan is trying to show me this bowel loop terminating right at the level of the SMA. I think he's trying to show me an SMA syndrome. Can you tell us how you got to that point? Yeah, I mean, I'm just guessing to some degree what he's trying to show me now, but we see the stomach coming up. That's not, and then there's a small bowel loop, which is, you know, probably Dewey um, coming. And over here, we again see markedly distended stomach. We see that the, this is, so here's your aorta. Here's your celiac axis. Here's your SMA. And we see that this SMA is almost right up against the aorta. Normally it would be leaning out a little bit. And whatever bowel loop is distended looks like it's sort of ending in the approximate region. If you can, you know, right here is what, like a third of the way up the liver. I mean, that's about a third of the way up the liver where that's ending. And so I think 
this is going to end up being an SMA syndrome. Um, it's so much easier to do this when you can actually scroll through them. <laughs> but um, I'm guessing this that's what Jordan is trying to show. Yeah, and you said something about where the bowel ends close to SMA. Can you show us how you... I'm, I'm not able, yeah, that, that's actually what I can't show you because I can't okay. scroll. That makes it, sense. It's, it's, that, that's what I'm, if I could, if I could tell you that, I could definitively tell you if that's what he's showing us or not. Um, I mean, it's, it's very hard to know, but this, it's this lateral, or it's, yeah, it's the sagittal picture here. That's, mm -hmm. that's very much leaning me in that direction because I'm seeing the SMA so close and all of these bowel loops are kind of in this portion of the abdomen and they look like they're, they're beaking down towards that. It's really this picture. It looks like it's beaking down towards that region without being able to scroll. I can't promise that it's not going to continue down here somewhere, but that's my best guess. Okay. Got a couple questions for you, uh, Sanjeev. Yeah. Uh, first of all, um, just in case, Remind everybody what SMA is and what SMA syndrome is. Ah, uh, yeah. So SMA is, all right. So if you look at your abdominal vasculature, you have um, three major vessels supplying your viscera that come, or your, well, your, your bowel loops coming off your aorta, all coming off anteriorly. The top one is the celiac axis. And actually, let me see if I can do this for you. Yeah, this is another case that we're going to show in a few minutes. Um, so here's an axial picture, and it's not contrast in hand, so it's harder to see, but this is your aorta. This is your celiac axis coming off. Actually, that's your SMA. Your celiac, you, you poorly see because of, there's no contrast. But what happens is one branch of the celiac goes off to the left, that's your left gastric artery, and that supplies the lesser curvature of your stomach or goes around the lesser curvature, curvature of your stomach. And then you have your, uh, your common hepatic artery, which breaks into your proper hepatic artery, artery, which supplies your liver, and your gastroduodenal artery, which goes around the head of the pancreas. So that's your celiac axis. Your SMA is right here. That's your superior mesenteric artery, and that supplies the uh, the small bowel and proximal portion of the large bowel. And it is um, this is not a bad illustration. See how it, it, in this patient your your SMA projects forward, and it really shoots forward. So you have this space in between. In our patient, we didn't have that. And then any tips to differentiate the duodenum and jejunum? Uh, sure, but it's all anatomic. So your duodenum comes like this. Uh, I'll tell you what, let me. So here's your stomach. Your stomach comes along and then coming, so this is your gastric antrum, your duodenum pops up from the gastric antrum right here, that's your duodenal bulb, and then your second portion hugs the head of the pancreas, coming down to your third portion here, which runs along the underside of the pancreas, and your fourth portion is right here, going into your duodenum. So it's anatomic that on, in, as far as the, the actual tissue characteristics of it on imaging, they look identical. Um, but anatomically, you can differentiate if you can scroll. Great. Awesome. Okay, now we get to see what, what, what got revealed. Let's find out. Yeah, these are the key images that Jordan had picked out. Um, and then the next one will reveal the diagnosis. SMA syndrome. There we go. Mm -hmm. And discussion.
So I think we discussed it. So basically what happens is the SMA, it gets, uh, when you lose the fat between that and the aorta, it compresses the second, the, the third portion of the duodenum and leads to a, a small bowel obstruction, which in, as in this case could be fairly severe. Um, and these tend to be young patients. They tend to be people with histories of relatively rapid weight loss, usually pretty young. Um, and so it's just something to keep in the back of your mind. And some radiologists just look at findings. I tend to approach my patients um, by looking at the history, which is, this is my plug to all of y'all. Please write good histories when you give me patients, because for me at least, I tend to go in with a differential and prove and disprove different aspects of it, probably because I kind of like medicine. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's kind of what a medicine doctor does, except I do it with pictures. Just as an advertisement, um, when, when I'm on service, I will often, uh, when Sanjeev is in, in the house, I'll often go down and take, take the entire team down when we have a question like this. Um, and it's amazing how much uh, he learns from us and we learn from him. Um, and I also will do that. Uh, I've called him up several times uh, when he's been working from home. Uh, and and being friends with the radiologist is one of the best things you can do. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's great for both of us. Uh, the truth is, I, as, as Dr. Centaur said, I mean, I, I've learned so much from, from those. Like, those are my favorite interactions. And if y'all ever have questions, just call me. Honestly, I have a cell phone. Call me. Um, okay, let's do case two. Case two. A 30-year-old with poorly controlled diabetes, hypertension, and obesity with COVID, uh, progressing to multi-lobar pneumonia requiring ventilation, now in the ICU and requiring vasopressor support with rising lactate. Okay, so... What are we thinking, right? We read this history and we're and and sort of what's going on through our head is a couple of questions. Is this COVID effect? Is it um, some other sort of multi-organ failure type of situation where um, it's basically a hypotension leading to bowel ischemia? Um, so COVID infection of the bowel, bowel ischemia. Or is it some, is it ischemia, but ischemia is secondary to some sort of an embolic event um, because that can happen in, in COVID as well. Um, and then the other question is, you know, poorly controlled type two diabetes, is he on um, metformin or some other drug and has he developed lactic acidosis? Those are sort of the top things in my differential looking at this, but we'll see what the pictures show. All right, so he's got some stuff at his lung basis that's abnormal. If you take a look on the, at the previous patient or at the air hair, this doesn't look like that because there are these um, opacities, and that's probably his pneumonia. And something is wrong with his liver. So he's got this patchy appearance to his liver. It's... Um, the liver should be relatively homogenous, kind of like that. This liver has this patchy appearance and I'm seeing a locule of gas that's relatively peripheral. Now, if one sees central gas, one thinks more biliary, but peripheral gas that looks like this, I wonder, well, we'll see. There's, there is, it is somewhat, oh no, okay. So we see this gas, we follow it centrally, and then we look here, and that's his portal vein, and he's got portal venous gas. Uh, this guy is sick, um, and he's got, a, he's got a bad looking liver. He's got this patchy appearance to his liver, and then look at this bowel. So it's normal to see gas on the, on the, uh, the non-dependent side of the bowel, but this gas on the dependent side, it looks to me like it's in the wall. That doesn't look to me like it's in the stool um, or, or fluid in the, in the bowel. That's concerning. I think this guy's got dead bowel pneumatosis. Um, yeah, that, this kind of linear gas that's progressing around bowel loops 
highly concerning for pneumatosis. So whatever is going on has caused him fairly severe ischemia. I'm looking here behind the liver, behind the caudate lobe of the liver, which is this little um, S-shaped structure here. That's his IVC. It's not super compressed, which makes me think that he's not too hypotensive, at least at this time, not, not at the time of the scan. Um, so what I'm looking for now is to see if I can find a cause. So at this point, I'm wondering, is it a venous infarct? Has he clotted off some major venous structure? And uh, is that the issue? Is it previous hypotension that we're just not seeing at this time? Yeah, nice portal venous gas. Look at that. Or is this a, an arterial infarct of some sort? And uh, at least his central arteries looked okay to me on my initial scan. There's his aorta. SMA is okay. I don't see a celiac, but that may just be because Jordan didn't show it to me. Um, anyway, this is clearly bowel ischemia. Um, so Sanjeev, uh, as you, as, as we go through these, it looks, looks like they're, uh, the bowel is distended. True. Um, compared to what I'm used to seeing. And there's some air fluid levels, a couple places, but just a whole lot of air. And, um, what, what makes you think of this being uh, dying bowel. Can you point that out for us? Yeah, that was what I was saying. So the air inside the bowel doesn't bother me. Yeah, yeah, the bowel's dilated, sure, and it's got air fluid levels. You'll see that in obstructions. You'll see it in dead bowel. It basically indicates stasis. Mm -hmm. um, but what worries me is what I was saying is it's this non-dependent or it's a dependent gas that's mm -hmm. circumferential around the loop. So up here, this is you can't really differentiate whether that's abnormal or normal, but here, I mean, you can see there's gas that's circumferentially going around that I'm sure continues up here. That's gas in the wall of the bowel. So that's pneumatosis of the bowel. Um, and we see it nicely in this one. Um, and, you know, over here as well. So, I mean, these are, when you see this, that's almost always dead or dying bowel. Um, there may even be a little extra luminal gas here where you, where some of this is perfed, but it's hard to tell, uh, whether that's partial volume or, you know, there is, well, that could be in, that could be in a, a vein or it could be extra luminal, a little hard to say in, on these pictures. We have to follow it, but yeah, that's, that's what this case is. Obviously now this is, um, there's some fluid, but again, that's expected. Um, so pretty sick bowel. One thing I'm noticing here, just in looking at this, the distal bowel looks like it's somewhat preserved. You could wonder if this is like a, an embolic SM, SMA um, event, but I don't see where I'm being shown that, I guess. Other questions? So somebody asked, uh, bowel pneumatosis, uh, does that, that, so they, it implies that's pathic mnemonic for bowel ischemia. Bowel ischemia. Uh, nothing is truly pathic mnemonic in, in, in radiology. Um, no, so it is very, very likely to represent bowel ischemia. Truth is, after a colonoscopy, sometimes people can, uh, especially if there's a biopsy, people can get some pneumatosis of the bowel. There, are, there is a condition called benign pneumatosis um, that can just happen sporadically, or uh, I think steroids predisposed to it, and a few other drugs. Um, so no, it is not truly pathognomonic, but it is highly suggestive, especially in the right clinical setting. 
and uh, the 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 question about air in the Venus system. Yeah, so portal Venus system. So what you have here, uh, if you look, these are your hepatic vessels. These are hepatic veins. I can probably convince you that they would be coming together at a point here, if you look at their angulation, and that point would be the IVC right here. Uh, and so that's your uh, systemic venous system coming from the liver. Here we see there's this structure and it's got contrast. So it looks like a vessel, pretty bright contrast. It's also got this gas in it. And if you come up, you have these branching um, gas densities right here. And uh, that's almost certainly, um, those are almost certainly branch portal veins coming off of this. So that's gas in your portal venous system. If you think about how the blood flow works, the portal venous system drains the bowel. So when you have gas in your bowel, you can often pop some gas into your portal venous system. And that's another ominous sign. Gotcha. So it sounds like, but only if there's gas in the bowel wall, can you get it in the venous system? Cause that's where the vessels are. I think they're right. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's the most common situation. It is okay. possible to get portal venous gas when there's not gas in the bowel wall, but it's again, this is by far the most common situation. Yeah. And then somebody also mentioned a fistula could potentially cause gas in places that it's not supposed to be, but, um, yeah, sure. Yeah. Great. So we want to take a look and see what the answer yeah. is. So he just, uh, he put it on lung windows to show us the gas in the bowel wall. That's, an, that's something, that's actually something that I'll do, um, on a lot of my cases where there's abdominal pain, if I, especially if I can't differentiate, I stick it on lung windows. Sometimes that will um, make it more clear where the, where the gas is in the bowel. It's also sometimes easier to follow bowel loops on lung windows, but yeah, I mean, here we have just massive um, pneumatosis of the bowel. Okay, so he didn't give us the cause of the ischemia, um, just ischemic bowel with portal venous gas. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the two big takeaways from that that I didn't I haven't heard of before is the dependent areas um, of the the gas kind of being in the bowel wall um, I hadn't heard of that before and then switching over your abdominal image to a lung image to kind of help you look for um, gas pneumatosis and so I think those are two things I'll definitely take away I hadn't heard of before yeah, and, and you will, it's easy to get fooled where, as to where the, the gas is. Here, it's fairly extensive. We sit there and, and try to nitpick at the tiny little hairs and, and find um, small little foci of gas. And sometimes it can be really hard to tell, but in this case, it's pretty clear. I mean, especially on these lung windows, it makes it really obvious how there's no bowel wall outside of this. And so yeah. that's, that's really concerning. So I might as well tell, remind people, some people have heard this case before, some people haven't, um, but this was uh, a man, I think he was in his 40s or 50s, who uh, came to us because of a kidney stone. So on the internal medicine services, why are they admitting this guy with a kidney stone? But he actually uh, said he was passing a kidney stone, and then he had a CT of the abdomen, which showed other kidney stones. The story is, uh, as best as we could reconstruct it, about 20 years previously, he'd been diagnosed with ulcerative colitis while in the service. Subsequently, the diagnosis was changed to Crohn's disease, but he was on mesalamine as if he had ulcerative colitis. He'd, he had been in the hospital a month before with a kidney stone, and it was blamed upon his Crohn's disease, because Crohn's disease causes increased oxalate and you can get calcium oxalate crystals. We noticed that he was hypercalcemic. And we went down to look at the, the film with uh, Sanjeev. And in looking at the film, we were looking to see if there's any evidence of inflammatory bowel disease. 
and what else could be going on. And so this, the, the nice thing about this case is we're gonna be able to scroll and he can, he, you can teach us Sanjeev how you scroll and thought about this case. Yeah, so the first question was, how does the bow look? And looking at this bow, his large bow, so far at least up here, looks relatively healthy. And what I mean by that is it's got its sort of normal rugal fold pattern where you see these indentations in the bowel. It's oftentimes in, in an ulcerative colitis patient, what you'll see is the bowel will kind of become straightened and more rigid appearing and um, often will be smaller caliber a little bit. And so this guy has relatively normal bowel. Now, UC tends to progress from distal to proximal. Over here, his sigmoid looks great. Coming down to his rectal region. I mean, one thing in radiology that I always tell people is follow the fat. His fat looks preserved here. I don't see any stranding to suggest any active inflammation. So if he has UC, it was really mild and really short-lived. Okay, so let's just stop right there because there, there are a couple things. First of all, that confirmed he'd had two recent colonoscopies, which were unremarkable. So we finally got the unremarkable word in there. <laughs> um, and uh, you, you've taught me a lot, Sanjeev, about uh, fat and fat straining. So maybe you could point that out and why that's so useful when you're looking at CT scans. Yeah, and I think, let me see, is this is... Let me see if he had a little bit more. He had a little bit more fat on his prior study. So let's take a look at his prior. This is what fat is supposed to look like, this dark stuff. He's, he's just lost some weight, so it's, it's a little bit harder to tell. But if you take a look in 2019, look at how dark this fat is. It doesn't have the white strands running through it. Highly fortuitously in this patient coming up, we see that he's got some stranding of his mesentery hair with a few lymph nodes. That's um, often a, uh, an inflammatory condition called mesenteric paniculitis. It can also be lymphoma um, or one other diagnosis that we'll talk about in a minute. But um, it's uh, this is what stranded fat looks like. So compare this to this, and you see how it's kind of white and hazy it has these strands running through it. That's the edema that comes along with inflammation. So I, I like to call that the uh, uh, radiologist said rate. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. That's exactly what it is. You're basically taking the said rate of the, of the fat. Um, and so that's, that's your inflammatory stranding. And we see that this colon again, looks just golden. And I think it's easier to see on this study than on the previous one looking at his terminal ilium, I mean, I don't have contrast, which I, I like, I like contrast in all my studies. So I say, if you can give a patient in the abdomen contrast, there is, there are very few reasons not to, he's getting a renal stone protocol, so that's fine. But um, contrast is incredibly helpful. Um, and if you look here, his terminal ilium looks good. There's no stranding and there's no real fat deposition either. Sometimes when bowel is angry for a long time, it gets fat deposition uh, in, in the wall or creeping fat around it. He has no creeping fat. He has a very normal looking terminal ileum. He has very normal looking large bowel. I'm not saying this couldn't be inflammatory bowel disease, but if he's really had inflammatory bowel disease for 20 years, it is very unlikely that his bowel looks this good. So I was a little suspicious of the diagnosis. So we had a great question um, uh, one of our uh, favorite uh, Hemong fellows up in New York, uh, Fernand Batish, uh, asked this question. Is there advantage to oral plus IV contrast versus IV contrast alone? He's been at several institutions and some prefer one and some prefer the other. Yeah, I like IV contrast. Um, and in fact, I think in most cases, IV oral contrast is not particularly useful. It is useful in thin patients uh, in differentiating small bowel loops from lymph nodes. So every lymphoma patient I would give it to. 
Um, or a patient, if I'm looking for lymphadenopathy in the abdomen, especially a thin patient, then I, I, I would, I would give oral contrast, but I personally like IV contrast, but he's right. It's institution dependent UAB. They like oral contrast and, and don't necessarily use IV contrast where I was trained at Wash U, We, we almost never used oral contrast and used IV contrast in everybody. And so I've gotten used to differentiating things um, just using IV. And that's, to me, there's, I'll say this, there is more information gleaned from IV without oral than um, oral without IV in almost every case. The, for me, I think there's more often more information gained from IV without oral than IV with oral. I would rather have IV without oral, but it is, it's, it's radiologist dependent. I mean, there are people at the VA who believe the opposite. So we've had this argument before. Okay. So after looking at that part of the film, um, the, 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 and everybody knows I'm very skeptical. I was saying, this just doesn't sound like inflammatory bowel disease. I know he carries this diagnosis, but he doesn't, he, he didn't have diarrhea. He didn't, he didn't, he'd never had a fistula. Um, and then we look at the film with Sanjeev and uh, it looks like the large bowel and small bowel looks pretty good. Since this was a, a stone protocol, why don't you show us the stones also before we get to the, the, the other part? These are the stones. So here we have kidneys and we have what looks like bone. In fact, me, on bone windows, you can see it looks like cortical bone. Um, we have what looks like bone sitting in the collecting system of the kidney um, and mildly inflaming this right collecting system. Um, it looks like he probably passed kind of a decent sized stone into the urinary bladder right there. Yeah, he, he presented with hematuria that, that, that cleared up after a day or two. But then you saw something else, which is why you want a good radiologist because we, we were asking about kidney stones and we're asking about inflammatory bowel disease. And he said, yeah, but what about this? Yeah, so one thing is this mesenteric paniculitis with these lymph nodes that it, you normally just say mesenteric paniculitis, less like lymphoma and you're done. But on today's scan or on the most recent scan, the other thing I kind of noticed that's more prominent on this scan than the other was this. If you look, and it's a little bit hard to differentiate because again, the absence of IV contrast, but if you, it's, if you look, there are some extra densities here um, between the stomach and the liver. And that made me wonder if there's some sort of lymphadenopathy going on. Um, and so a uh, gastrohepatic ligament lymphadenopathy and coming down, there are a few other areas where I saw some abnormal lymph nodes, like right there. Scrolling up and down, you can see there's some abnormal lymph nodes there. Some retroperitoneal lymphadenopathy. So this guy's got fairly widespread lymphadenopathy. Um, don't really see a ton, but then there, there's some lymph nodes in the groin. See how these are medial to the vessels, by the way, and outside of this fascia. So he had some groin lymphadenopathy too. And so what I was curious about was initially I was wondering, is there, is this a lymphoma patient and is he on some chemo drug that's leading to kidney stone development or something like that? But then when Bob mentioned he was hypercalcemic, I said, we, we, we were discussing and we started wondering if this could be sarcoid. So we had, we had the, we, um, for people who've heard this case before, we had the, the information from him that every time he was put on steroids, he felt a lot better. And he didn't feel very good when he was not on steroids. Uh, there was a question, uh, can, you, can you comment on hydronephrosis in a non-contrast CT? You can, yeah. So this, he, he didn't really have any, um, is the truth, if you look. You'd see fluid density in the middle of the kidney here. It's harder to see non-con, but you can see it and he didn't have it. This is just a parapelvic cyst. Um, 
he doesn't have any hydro. He may so have. So does anybody have any questions about that lymphadenopathy being able to, uh, was that clear what Sanji was showing us? The, the lack of comments suggests to me that everybody's happy. So oh, yeah. what, I, what I recently told Sanjeev is uh, we, we talked to GI and they did an endoscopic ultrasound and uh, uh, got a node and biopsied it uh, and it was a non caseate and granuloma. He also had an elevated uh, 125 vitamin D level uh, in the face of hypercalcemia and all of his other hypercalcemic tests were negative. He had nothing on his chest X-ray, if I remember right. Is that right, Sanji? Yeah, it was. It was a stone cold normal chest X-ray, but we don't have a recent chest CT on him. Yeah. Um, so sometimes you'll see mediastinal lymphadenopathy more clearly on a on a chest on a chest. Actually, we did have a chest CT, but it was normal from what I remember. So yeah. he, his his sarcoid was predominantly in the upper abdomen. Yeah. Any questions about that or any comments while, while we have Sanjeev here? Does it, could everybody tell that this was much more normal looking bowel than some of the bowel we saw before? I'm getting no comments in the, in the chat. Please, somebody give me a thumbs up or something. <laughs> Is anybody still awake? <laughs> Did we put you to sleep? Lindsay? I have that effect. No, no I'm it. here. I'm here. <laughs> so, so what, what do, you know, you're going into GI, so uh, this is something you're going to be living with every day. Why, why, don't, why don't you make some comments about how this has helped you uh, think about uh, your, your process of looking at uh, abdominal CTs? You know, I think the starting from the first case, you know, if it looks like obstruction, it could be obstruction, but don't forget SMA syndrome, something that's not in the lumen. Um, or not like an adhesion or something that could be causing obstruction. Don't forget about vascular um, etiologies. And the second one, I kind of talked about both of those, the dependent gas. Um, and then I can't remember what the other one I said. Putting it on lung windows. Yes, lung windows yeah. and the abdomen. I had never done that before. Um, so yes, that one. And then this last one, always questioning the diagnosis of IBD. If it's not, doesn't sound like it's... Um, been something that's been active or symptomatic um, and always going back to the drawing board if it doesn't make sense and always go down to see your radiologist um, at the VA and elsewhere. Yeah, we like seeing you. The, well, at least I like seeing you. I can't promise that every radiologist will like seeing you, but I like seeing medicine docs. It makes me happy. Somebody asked a question about uh, differentiating between the string signing Crohn's and arterial paniculitis. So the string sign is when you have, that's when you're giving contrast and it's, uh, it's typically something you talk about more in barium studies, but it's when you have massively, um, like if you imagine, here's your terminal ileum. If you have markedly edematous tissue, you could have a really thin lumen. Um, that's something that, that we would call the string sign. Um, I'm not sure what arterial paniculitis is. Mesenteric paniculitis is, is this stuff up here. And that's the hazy mesentery um, with the lymph nodes. So it's, it's a bit different than, than uh, the string sign, which is something you think of more in the terminal ileum with a really narrow lumen. On CT, we don't really talk about string sign much because we can actually see the inflammation if you give contrast or if you give IV contrast. Great. Well, I hope everybody has learned some stuff today. I certainly have. And uh, Sanjeev, we really appreciate it. I know that you have to get ready for uh, 
fam family uh, dinner here in just about 11 minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's uh, it, uh, I, I should probably go up there and help the wife out so I don't get killed. Um. <laughs> Can I make one other, one other quick point that you mentioned tonight? And Jordan definitely mentioned it whenever he was preparing these slides. He gave like a HPI from the from the medicine notes or whoever was taking care of the patient and then like what radiology gets. And I think just seeing his emphasis on what we give, you know, the radiologist versus what's actually, you know, helpful. Um, so don't forget to give as much history as you can in that little bitty box that we're giving. Don't just get nausea and vomiting or abdominal pain, kind of give a little bit more of the history to, to help our colleagues out. Yeah. I mean, the, the truth is, there's a reason that radiologists are trained as doctors. Like we, we also, if, if given a history, we can, we can provide a lot more information to you than if we just get nausea, vomiting and, you know, say, eh, patient's got a bowel obstruction. Great. You know, but if we can, if we get more history, then we can perhaps give you more of an etiology and guide you. Excellent.